Hey, everybody. Listen, first of all, just uh, glad to see you again on the live tab. Uh, as you saw yesterday's show that we finally did, uh, where Gary was explaining that we were off the live tab for a while because of inadvertently crossing a, a, a really kind of a silly YouTube specific requirement that you can't sh handle a weapon at all on a live stream video. Even though you can put all kinds of shooting stuff on a recorded thing, you can't do it on a live stream which anyway, it doesn't matter what the, whether I agree with it or not, that's what happened. But so we were knocked off. Very glad to be back on with you. And so now here we are uh, on Sunday, uh, a little bit unusual, but we want to try to catch up on some things because ordinarily we would have done our Intel brief on Friday, uh, but instead of missing it, because we were not able to produce it at that time, we're going to do it here on Sunday to make sure you get caught up on all the things that happened last week and give you a running start into things you need to watch for this coming week. Uh, so, so the first thing we want to start with is, is uh, one of the big things that happened during the week was that uh, FBI Director Christopher Wray uh, kind of alluded to in his testimony that maybe Trump wasn't hit with a bullet after all. Maybe it was some sort of shrapnel or something like that, uh, which kind of set off a bit of a firestorm and some angst among a lot of people. Here's what he said at the hearing. Uh, Director Wray, to the best of your understanding, how close did the assassin's bullet come to killing President Trump? My understanding is that either it or some shrapnel uh, is what you know grazed his uh, his ear. So I don't know that I have the the very, actual very distance. Very very close. Though. What's that? Very very close. You would agree. Yes. The the whole the, the raising of the question at all w was p very curious to me, and I still to this day don't understand what the intent was or why he thought it was useful to say that. Uh, because when you look at the actual uh, imagery of the shooting, I'm going to show that to you in just a second, you see that there was nothing that you know, shrapnel could have come from. And for those who may not know, shrapnel is ordinarily a term used uh, with artillery shells. When they hit the ground, they, they have a high explosive charge and they will explode. Uh, and, and they have this, this steel shell casing that then sends shards of metal flying through the air called shrapnel. And people get shrapnel wounds, and that's what hits a lot of people. That's what uh, wounds others and certainly kills anyone within the range of it. So to say that shrapnel came off a bullet is, first of all, a little unusual. But even if you want to say, well, what I meant was that if a bullet hits an object, it can shatter and send tiny shards of metal out. And so perhaps that's what he meant. I don't know. But I'm going to show you an image from this is what was tele telecast live from C-SPAN on the day of the uh, assassination attempt on July 13th. And you'll see, especially when the camera pans out uh, toward the end, there is absolutely nothing in the area which could any way could possibly cause shrapnel. Watch this. And, you know, that's a little bit old, that chart. That chart's a couple of months old. And if you uh, want to really see something that said, take a look at what happened. Oh. Let's stop right there. So you see that there that the, the platform is the highest point uh, on the, the area, obviously. So there's no uh, obstructions with anybody's field of vision, et cetera. Um, and, and he's, you know, it came from the right side on top of that. So even if the, the, any possibility that will perhaps the, the microphone got hit or something, you obviously would have heard that it would have had an evident sound, but nothing at all happened like that. And there was zero, absolutely nothing on the other side. And we have that famous picture from the New York times photographer where you could actually see the, the trace of the, the actual bullet as it passed, uh, right on the other side of his head. So. Uh, there is nothing that any evidence of any kind would even suggest the possibility that there was anything else flying through the air other than the trace of the bullet. And yet that's exactly what he came up and said. And, and there was uh, also a, uh, a statement released by uh, Ronnie Jackson, now a member of Congress, former uh, President Trump's uh, uh, doctor, uh, who said he, he examined the evidence uh, and he said, you know, I, I've, I used to be a, a battlefield doctor when he was in the military and he said that uh, that was a gunshot wound and subsequently i think it was the new york times or maybe it was even newsweek uh which reported that there the autopsy not autopsy report sorry a little different the medical report showed that there was a two centimeter gash that was cut uh by the path of the bullet on the way through and they said yeah that's that's exactly what it was 
Um, so it's, it's unclear what Ray had in mind and the evidence just doesn't support anything he said. And, and, and he, uh, I think on Saturday, uh, yeah, on Saturday, it was also uh, another level of curiosity because some f photographs were taken of Trump when he was meeting with Netanyahu, which we'll talk about subsequently. Uh, and he was taking pictures for the first time without his bandage. And you, you don't see any two centimeter cut out of his ear. So it's, it's a little unusual that I, I actually did some Googling some, and I saw in the Washington post, some, they interviewed some doctors and they said, well, the, the ear can from small abrasions can, can heal anywhere from four to 24 days. And I think it had been nine since the, the event took place by the time the photographs were taken. So I guess he heals real fast or something, but that's, it's just a little odd to not see even scratches on there, but uh, we've, we've all seen the pictures of the blood and everything. So uh, just a big mystery going on with that. But uh, there were some other things that he said during that testimony, uh, Director Ray, that also bear examining. And one of the things he said was an answer to uh, one of the questions that we had on our show from our investigations going on is how many shell casings were actually found, if there were any found at the site of the shooter, uh, Thomas Crooks. Here's what Ray said. How many shots did the shooter fire? Well, we, we know that he fired at least eight because we recovered eight cartridges on the roof. Okay. And, and are all the, the cartridges and the unspent bullets, have they been, you know how many there are, you have accounted for all of those? We, so I, I assume, it, I, yeah. We believe we have, we believe we have, again, there's was lots of work still ongoing, but yes, we believe we have accounted. And did the recovered shells, the cartridges match the shooter's rifle? Uh, my recollection is yes. Okay. And you conducted an analysis that confirms that? Uh, well, we work with ATF, but yes, so, so some of the work has been divided up. But. So first of all, Ray's body language does not fill one with confidence that he's done any of those things as he hesitated and paused several times and looked down and said, well, that's my understanding. So it sounds to me like, yeah, I haven't done any of that anyway. But let's let's zero in on the number of shells because that is a lot more important than may appear at first sight here. Now, as we've shown here also on our previous uh, sessions, when you look at the the uh, acoustic signature of these uh, rounds, there is a clear, clear distinction, even from somebody who doesn't know anything about any ballistics, that the first three shots are materially different than the second batch of five, and then an, another one, uh, an, a sixth one, which may or may not have come from even that weapon. It's, it's unclear about exactly where all these weapons came from, except that there are distinctions between them. So... Uh, first of all, so there were nine shots of someone fired. We got to find out who that was. But where the shell casings were reported to have been found uh, is also a big problem, which I've not seen so far mentioned in any anything online where anybody's finding any problem with it. But I'm going to show you why it is a problem. First of all, on the body cam footage that was provided uh, by Senator Chuck Grassley, who got these released, there was three separate files that he's released one of them, you see the men on the, on the roof uh, around Crooks after the body has been discovered talking about the shell casings. Shells over here on both sides. Looks like what, at least eight? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. At least eight. Okay, so now that's important because what these people have clearly said, and we don't we don't get to clear a picture because they have so many things tiled out a lot more than just the body. I'm not sure why they have such a big area tiled out because it would help if we could see with our own eyes some of this. We saw part of it, and I'm going to show you. Uh, I zoomed in on, on one of the high def pictures uh, or one of the high def uh, videos later or earlier on, so I'll show you one of the shell casings itself. But they're saying that they were on both sides of the body. Now that should be a red flag because shell casings only go one direction. And, and as I've showed you a little bit of the video that I've shot to, about how hard the shot would have actually been for Crooks, uh, especially to have a first shot kill shot, which should have been absent Trump's turning of his head uh, to show you how difficult that was. Well, now I want you to look at that video again, and I've slowed down a couple of parts of it so that you can see how uh, the shell casings are ejected from the ejection port of an AR-15 style rifle. Watch this.
So now you see, I've slowed it down here. So you can see that's where the shell casings come out. That's the ejection port right there. And they come out to the right. And they're... Uh, now, and I've slowed this one down again, too. Now, watch where these uh, shell casings hit the wall. So there's one toward the front, another one a little bit to the right, another further to the right of that, and then back in the other direction. So you see there, it's not uh, precise, but you see they're all shooting with the similar force, actually the same force, out to the right. So we know from photographs that Crooks had his weapon like this and was oriented downrange. And so the the all the shell casings, all of them, anything that was fired from that weapon would be to the right and, and something close to right outside of it. Now, a number of these shell casings were found well forward of the body on the right. And in fact, we, we, we were able to see, I think, three to four of them. Um, the, 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 you can't see the body in this one, but it's, it's, uh, to the left of that, uh, the little ribbed area and, and I don't know, three or four feet below it. Uh, so further down. So it's unclear why there would have been any forward of his body, even on the right, but there was quite a few of them. Some were even on the other side of the center piece there, uh, the center rib in the middle. Uh, but then there were some on the left side, according to the men on the ground, how would bullet uh, shell casings get to the other side of the body when you just saw in that video how all of the 100% are fired out, shot out sideways from the weapon itself. So that's a question that needs to be answered. And that's why it's important that uh, if, they, if they've released this body cam, then they should release all of the forensic evidence so that we can see like any crime scene where they would have every shell marked, they would have a photographs of everything so we can see exactly where they were in relation to the body. Uh, something's just not lining up uh, again things continue not to line up and we're gonna we're gonna take a look at that uh we'll keep following that wherever the information leads and we'll keep bringing it to you okay next thing uh, that happened this past week which was very noteworthy uh in, an, in really a bad way we had both john mearsheimer on this week and ambassador Chaz freeman uh and we talked about uh, benjamin netanyahu's wednesday meeting uh, to address a joint session of Congress, which is supposed to be one of the signature uh, honors that we give to any foreign head of state. We don't do it very often. It's actually fairly rare. Um, but when we do, it's, it's a great honor. So given that right before this, the International uh, Court of Justice issued a ruling against Israel saying that uh, they were basically uh, being in the wrong on their policies for settlers in occupied territories. And they had illegally and unjustly uh, pushed out Palestinians. And this is going back decades, not just since October 7th, but they were found guilty of that and that they're ordered to pay restitution and make changes, et cetera. Uh, and, and this is on top of the ICJ ruling a month or two back where it was found that there was plausible evidence of a genocide by Israel against uh, against the Palestinian people in Gaza. So everything imaginable that you can imagine that's tainted on Netanyahu, yet still he was able to come and, do, and address our Congress. And it wasn't just that he addressed the Congress, but it's that Congress was wildly enthusiastic about it uh, with 58 standing ovations as part of it. Um, and it. And it was something, it was a spectacle to see. And as, uh, as our two guests this week showed, one that they did not like. You want to remember that the International Court of Justice, looking at the information that was available by late December of 2023, concluded that there was sufficient information to make a plausible case that Israel was committing genocide in Gaza. Let's think about that. And what happened yesterday, the leader who is responsible for executing this genocide was invited to speak before the U.S. Congress. He was given 58 standing ovations. Mr. Netanyahu's speech was directed mainly at hardline voters in Israel and at the stooges that the U.S. members of Congress have become. I know that 80 of them did not attend, and that's to their credit. But those who did attend and applauded should be ashamed. And and listen, uh, both Mearsheimer and uh, Ambassador Freeman both emphasized in pretty emotional terms that they personally felt in, uh, embarrassed uh, for, for what had happened. And they said they were ashamed 
to be associated with a country that would be doing that sort of thing, which is very unlike these these guys. I mean, they a diplomat by by name for Ambassador Freeman, and and uh, of course John Mearsheimer has just been an, an eminent uh, scholar for for decades. And, and so for them to both say in these really strong language, uh, that really is noteworthy. And and I want to show you, aside from what's already been said there, I want to show you a, a one clip from that uh, uh, presentation of Netanyahu, when you see, especially why Ambassador Freeman said he considered them stooges, meaning the congressmen, helpful, useful idiots, as Netanyahu would say about someone else, but it seemed like it would be more appropriate to talk about our own members of Congress. If you can, with Cringeworthy, watch this. Now, just as malicious lies were leveled for centuries at the Jewish people, Malicious lies are now being leveled at the Jewish state. No, no, don't applaud. Listen. The outrageous slanders that paint Israel as racist and genocidal are meant to delegitimize Israel, to demonize the Jewish state, and to demonize Jews everywhere. And no wonder, no wonder we've witnessed an appalling rise of anti-Semitism in America and around the world. My friends, Whenever and wherever we see the scourge of anti-Semitism, we must unequivocally condemn it and resolutely fight it, without exception. I, I mean, that one, that one really, of all of them, there's a bunch of cringeworthy statements that he made, but that was among the worst of them, because number one, it's filled with just insane amounts of inaccurate, uh, i.e. lies, things that he said, just just... Uh, just factually untrue. Uh, and then he started twisting around some things that did happen and, and gave them a different meaning. But th what might have been worse, or at least as bad, is that he basically was like a little puppeteer just using the, the members of Congress as a prop. I mean, look at that. He, they started to make an applause, and he's like, no, 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 don't do that. Sit there. I'm not finished yet. I want to keep going on. He, he didn't want the applause line there. He was going to build up to it rhetorically and emotionally, and he wanted, you know, that almost fist pounding on the lectern moment to where everyone would then shoot up out of their feet, which they dutifully did. And, and I, I found that just embarrassing how easily we're manipulated by someone who was taking actions that are in his own, uh, that is harming his own interest, those of his country and our country. And, and we're just turning a blind eye to it all. And in fact, not merely a blind eye, but we're given raucous applause to it. And, and I just, it, it anguishes me because I, as I've talked about so many times on, on previous episodes of this going back months now, is that the path that Netanyahu is on will not accomplish the stated political objective, which is to bring peace and security to the people of Israel. He's saying that because of the heinous attack that did happen on October 7th, where Hamas terrorists did kill many innocent Israelis, thousands, uh, hundred, many hundreds of them, they were that deserves to be responded to like any nation would do of course they had every right to to get to respond to what happened to that but it matters how you do it because you can't say that this violation of human rights and of international law is going to be met with an even bigger violation of human rights and international law on a scale 30 to 1 not an, not an exaggeration an actual number it's actually higher than that could be a lot higher than that the, the number of people that were murdered by Hamas on October 7th is dwarfed by the number of innocent Palestinians who have been murdered since that time. And that's why the, the ICJ have not reached the ruling that it did and why further action is necessary. And that's why you see the, the continued uh, statement where the other things that Israel has done that's illegal, <clears throat> and, and especially with these settlers and all the things that go along with that, those things are based on evidence and extensive amounts of research and study and legal effects, not just somebody casting a, an, an accusation. It was based on very thorough evidence. And, and it's right before your eyes. You don't even have to hardly you know, look for it. You almost have to close your eyes not to see it. And it is so wide and so egregious because what Netanyahu is doing is going to harm Israel. Listen to me. Listen to me. If you're a friend of Israel, and if you love the Jewish people, and I do in both cases, then you should push back against what Netanyahu is doing and his, and his government, which it's not just him. It's many in his government. He's not the only one. 
And there's many in Israel also who support it, but they're in, in their blind hatred because of what happened on 10, seven, they are laying the foundation to harm their own country because every time you kill an innocent Palestinian person, you build more and more hatred towards Israel and the IDF than existed even before October 7th. So now then, instead of whatever the actual number was, 20, 30,000 members of the Hamas uh, military wing, now then you've probably got many times more men who are willing to fight to do whatever it takes uh, to go against Israel now because of all the innocent people. I mean, what, what does anybody think that's going to happen? Does anybody have this rational thought that uh, Israel can go in there and claim legitimate uh, collateral damage. Well, it's just the laws of war say if you're going after a target and, and they were using it, well, the, the, the blame is on them. That works when you're you know, trying to convince a, a friendly audience that what you're doing is right because they'll just go, yeah, that's right. That's part of, part of the warfare. It does zero on the other side of that equation. And the one that matters is what happens on the other side of that equation. And when their people are killed and they know they didn't do anything wrong and they see that they're just getting slaughtered, they see that their entire way of life is being wiped out. They see that their city is physically being destroyed so that it can't even sustain life well into the future. Even if the war ended tomorrow, they're going to hate the people who did it and they won't accept any of that. So it's a human response. We've seen it throughout human history throughout the world. Our, we're no exception to that. I mean, just look at our revolutionary period and how we reacted when we were being treated unjustly. And when the British tried to bring in military force, that's how our ancestors reacted. Why does anybody think that the Palestinians are any different than we were or any other people for that matter? So we're giving raucous applause to someone who is taking his country down a path that will create more instability, less security, and increase the risk that the war may even spread beyond its current boundaries. That's what's happening right now. And of course, we're just continuing to give all the weapons and ammunition and political cover and diplomatic cover so that they can continue doing these things that make no sense and will not help the people that we claim that we love. Listen to me carefully. Understand this. I don't care if you're even angry at what I'm saying here. It doesn't make any difference to me because you're harming, uh, your, your actions are actually harming the people you claim to want to help. And this is a long-term issue, and it is desperately worse than it was uh, on the 6th of October of last year. So there needs to be a change if there's to be any hope of limiting the damage and at least getting to a place to where Israel can have legitimate security and stability on its country, which I heartily desire. I want to see the Israeli people live in peace and not have to worry about rockets flying in anywhere or terrorist activity, etc. But folks, if it's not concurrent with the Palestinian people also having peace and security and a future and a hope, and the, the not have to worry about uh, an oppressive military occupation knocking on their doors at all hours or taking people away, summarily executing them or taking them into prison. They deserve the same thing. And if you don't have peace and security for both, you will have peace and security for neither. And even if you only care about the Israeli people, you should adopt and, and advocate what I just said about making sure that both of them have a future and a possible hope because without it, your side won't get it. Now, I say that we uh, we should get some changes, and I hope that we do. But if we think that, uh, you know, this coming election in America may be a, a way to get it through that or may get that change, uh, not a lot of prospects for that. Because after Netanyahu finished with uh, Congress up there, uh, he went down to Mar-a-Lago to see uh, uh, President Trump, who's hopefully going to be, in his view, will win in November. Here's how that one went. Did you guys talk about what your working relationship would look like if you were re-elected in November? We don't have to. We've had a good relationship. I was very good to Israel, better than any president's ever been. And we did so many Golan Heights. We did Jerusalem, uh, the capital. We actually built the embassy, but Jerusalem and uh, the Iran nuclear deal. Unfortunately, the Biden administration didn't do anything. We terminated the Iran nuclear deal, which was a tremendous thing, maybe the best thing that I did for Israel, but unfortunately the Biden administration didn't do anything about it. We could have had a deal one week after the election, we would have had a deal with Iran and everybody would have been happy, but uh, they didn't do anything with it. We had all the cards. Uh, Iran was not using terror at all because 
Under the Trump administration, we gave them no money. They didn't have money. Nobody was buying their oil. And now they're a rich country. So uh, it's too bad. But we would have had a deal with Iran. And it would have been a good deal for everybody, including Iran. It would have been a good deal. But it would have been, it would have saved the Middle East, uh, the Biden administration. Now she's taken over. And she's worse than him. She's actually worse than him. So we'll see how it goes. But if it all works out, uh, if we win, it'll be very simple. It's all going to work out and very quickly. If we don't, you're going to end up with major wars in the Middle East and maybe a third world war. So you had President Trump there just rattling off the lineage of things that he did, which basically he's saying, yeah, I can be even more pro-Israel than the current administration, which is doing a terrible job. And he talked about how he moved the capital to Jerusalem uh, and then extensively went on talking about what he's doing to Iran. Uh, Israel's arch enemy in the region. Uh, and, and listen, folks, I, you may be big Trump supporters, some of you, and, and that's that's fair fair enough. Anybody can take whatever choice they want. But let's be clear about something. This Getting rid of the joint uh, JCPOA, the, the Iran nuke deal in, in May of 2018, has been a disaster for our interest. Uh, and it has continued to exacerbate things because prior to that, even if it was flawed and, and the JCPOA was flawed, uh, but it was a significant constraint on Iranian capabilities, on their ability to produce fissile material, uh, which was being at an extremely low. I want to say it was uh, three to five percent uh, of, of purity. Now it's up to 60 percent. The amount of material that they had was was uh, minuscule only for research purposes. Now it's huge stockpile. Uh, all of which because we got out of the uh, agreement and gave up what leverage we had. Uh, and then we've increased the fears of the Iranian side. So many of them may now be thinking maybe they should go to a nuclear weapons program as the only way to ensure that they could keep us from coming in and attack them because you have people like John Bolton always talking about, you know, almost lusting, not almost lusting after wanting to attack Iran. I mean, he's just always advocating that. So, so are many others in really both parties. So it's not likely that there's going to be a big change if Trump wins. But now then that Biden himself is not running, uh, but uh, Vice President, uh, current Vice President Kamala Harris is, one might say, well, what would her position be? Here's what she said, uh, I think, right after the, uh, the uh, Netanyahu speech at Congress. It is time for this war to end and end in a way where Israel is secure. All the hostages are released. The suffering of Palestinians in Gaza ends, and the Palestinian people can exercise their right to freedom, dignity, and self-determination. Now, let's be clear. That was basically a campaign commercial because now everything she does is like 90 percent a campaign commercial to try and show how she's presidential. And you see in that, I mean, I had all the trappings of, of president uh, and she actually looked presidential then, and especially in contrast to to Joe Biden, who's you know struggling to to even get sentences out, as we've talked about before. Uh, but she also laid out this this long list of things that she wants to see. She wants peace for Israel. Uh, she wants return of all the hostages who are still being held in, in the Gaza Strip, um, and peace for Palestine, and and uh, you know a, a two state solution. Problem is. Uh, that is exact opposite of what Netanyahu has emphatically said that he wanted. And so she basically put a lot of things and said, hey, it would be great if I could eat all the food I want and never gain any weight. Um, if I could go to Mars and back on a Tuesday, you know, stuff that's pie in the sky that has no possibility of being uh, realized at all. And and when when you know that uh, Netanyahu will is adamantly opposed to any possibility of a two state solution and his whole career. And I'm talking his entire career going back into the nineties uh, has emphatically been to prevent that very thing. So the same way that you had Biden saying before uh, that, you know, two state solution is important. He said it at the state of the union address, it's something we're going to go. And then right after you always had Netanyahu publicly saying, no, we're not going to do it. We've had red lines about Rafa and some other places. And instead they went ahead and did that anyway. No one listens to what the white house says. And then, why should they when you see stuff like what happened Wednesday at the Capitol building? So not a lot of prospects that we're going to get a lot of change there. I hope we do, because if, as I've emphasized so hard here, if there's not changes in how Israel is taking its doing its business here, 
it's going to be harmed and the Palestinian people are going to continue to be harmed and the chance of a, an additional explosion, maybe even larger and more regional could result. We'll see how that goes. You can count on us to keep giving you the updates. Uh, all right, next I want to shift over to the Russia-Ukraine war because things were happening on that too. We had Larry Johnson, former CIA analyst, one of our uh, most popular guests that we have on the show here. Uh, he was talking about the Russia-Ukraine war and, and he was responding to a comment by uh, a retired three-star general, Ben Hodges, um, who was basically kind of saying, hey, you know what? Um, the the Russians are losing. They're not even doing that good. And we sh I don't know why anybody's talking about not supporting Ukraine anymore. Here's how that exchange went. I just keep thinking after 10 and a half years of war, two and a half years of large scale invasion operations, Russia still controls less than 20% of Ukraine. Their air force has failed its two most important tasks of air superiority and interdiction. The Navy is in retreat or underwater and they've lost half a million soldiers. Why would we press Ukraine to stop? Why, why aren't we helping them? Why aren't we accelerating? doing things to accelerate their ability to defeat Russia. I don't think in his career he ever actually had to write a condolence letter to a family that lost a son or a daughter because of combat actions taken under his command. That's part of the problem. It's just like a video game to him. He doesn't appreciate or even consider the actual human, human cost. cost. Because what Ukraine is experiencing, it's not just this immediate loss of manpower. This is going to be a multi-generational destruction of Ukraine because the men being killed are the men who are in their reproductive years. So they're not having babies or getting killed on the front line. So you're going to have that hole in the middle of the demographic chart. And once that hole appears, that cascades down going into the years to come. And here's Ben Hodges cheering it on. Yeah, and that's the anguishing part. Just just like we have the the problem with the the Israeli Hamas war and and it's imposing uh, challenges and cost on the people of Palestine. Here you have all the war lusters and this support for everything that Ukraine is doing, and that that includes from Kiev and Washington and London and Brussels and several other places in in uh, Western Europe. The bill payers are the Ukrainian people. The bill payers are the Ukrainian army because there is no military path. You've heard me say it a hundred times on this channel, zero for Ukraine to ever win. So to continue to go down a path to where all you're doing is, is claiming all of these things that on the surface may give the impression that Russia is not going to be able to win, or they're going to run out of steam or run out of ammunition and all the stuff we've been hearing for two and a half years of war. And it's not happened. In fact, the opposite is happening that they're gaining uh, domestic support. They're gaining uh, in, in diplomatic cover. They're expanding their, their influence around the world, their economy is growing and their military capacity is growing. The number of their troops is growing on and on and on while the opposite is happening to the Ukraine side. So instead of recognizing that and saying, hey, we need to find a negotiated settlement so that no more Ukrainian men die for no reason, uh, no more Ukrainian cities get turned to rubble and no more territory is, is given to you, Russia in some sort of a negotiated settlement afterwards. Instead of doing that, which is the only thing that is rational and logical and moral, instead we keep going down this path to where we just ignore all those things and the men like Ben Hodges, and there's many like him, who just continue to cheer and say, yeah, more war, more war. Keep sending your Ukrainian men in there. It may be another 10 years, especially if, if uh, Kamala Harris wins. Apparently she would stay on the same path that the current administration is on, which is to blind themselves to that and to keep going uh, basically until the Ukraine side collapses. Uh, we also had John Mearsheimer on this week talking about the same thing, talking about misleading people. Uh, he was refer, uh, answering a question and, and talking about something that President Zelensky had said where he's basically trying to tell you, and you'll see this in a second, that, you know, all right, we've got this plan to win. We have this plan to succeed um, and we're going to keep going. And Mearsheimer had this to say. I began today with a report on the work of the air defense, the completion of our warriors training and the deployment of patriots in Ukraine. We have already quite thoroughly planned our work with foreign audiences for August and September. Meetings and negotiations, participation in summits. Ukraine will get everything it needs to withstand and achieve its goals. What do you make of that mess he just said right there? Well, first of all, I don't know how many patriots he's going to get, but it's not going to make any difference. The fact is that Ukraine doesn't have the necessary air defenses 
to keep the Russians from bombing all across their country. And there is no evidence, none, that the West is going to be able to provide them with the necessary air defenses. So it's hard to know what he's talking about. And by the way, we, if you look at the effect of Russian air power and Russian missiles and Russian drones on what's happening in Ukraine, it is really having a profound effect. So not having those air defense missiles really matters. With regard to negotiations and dealing with the West to deal with this problem and that problem, it's all basically a waste of time. Uh, what the Ukrainians need is they need manpower, and they don't have that, and they're not going to get that. And they need weaponry, and they don't have enough of that, and they're not going to get that. So all of this is beside the point, and uh, Zelensky is... Uh, you know, he's making good comments for public relations purposes, but in terms of making substantive comments that really are telling us something about where the war is headed, he's not doing that. He's not doing that, but others are. And as one of the other aspects of uh, John Mearsheimer's uh, episode there, and by the way, these are all linked in, in the description below. You can go and uh, visit all of these if you watch, watch more of any one of these shows that you, if you'd like. Uh, he mentioned a Guardian uh, article that came out with uh, General Sersky, where a, a little odd uh, headline that was, again, chosen by the uh, editors, not by Sersky himself, because the headline is, I know we will win and how. But then you read the article and it's like, actually, he's telling you they're not going to win. So I don't know why they chose that headline, because what he did was point out that the, the number of tanks, artillery pieces, uh, air power, missiles, uh, and, and troop size are all huge uh, advantages for Russia. According to what he said in there uh, on the, the day that when they invaded in February 2022, Russia had somewhere around 100,000 troops on the ground. He said by the end of this year, they will have somewhere close to 700,000 Russian troops on the ground and, and, and triple the number of tanks and artillery pieces and, uh, you know, and artillery shells themselves, which was additional, uh, is even much higher than that. They're getting drones from, from Iran. They're getting missiles and artillery shells from North Korea, where they now have a military deal. Um, they're getting components and other things, assistance from China. So everything Russia could need, According to the commanding general of the Ukrainian side, they have overwhelming numbers that, that just can never be matched by the Ukrainian side. And at the moment, as we speak now, no one's even talking about it in the West. There's no like, OK, well, let's get this package of 500 more tanks and, you know, and 600 more artillery pieces and two million more artillery rounds. And as soon as we get this finished and we'll maybe we can start deliver. There's not even any talk about it, meaning there aren't any help coming. And, and already you haven't, you've seen a, a significant dwindling of armored vehicles showing up even on the defense in the Ukraine side because there aren't enough. They just don't have them. And Russia is methodically pushing back all along the 600 mile line of contact. And, and especially in, in about three or four areas, it's getting pretty serious. And uh, Alex of History Legends. Uh, detail this on a video that came out on Saturday. Um, uh, so I, I recommend you, you Googling him and watching that video there. Uh, we're going to have him on this coming week, by the way. He's going to be talking to us about some of that thing. So you'll be able to see it on our channel firsthand. But everywhere you look, uh, everything screams what we've been saying from the outset, that the war cannot be won by Ukraine. And it methodically progressively will be won by Russia if something doesn't happen to intervene, something massive and major. And that is either the, the NATO side decides to declare war in Russia and then they invade. And of course, that's hypothetical because if that did happen, it's nuclear war. It's not going to be conventional. There's nothing conventionally that can change this except a negotiated settlement that would potentially uh, prevent Russia from taking everything that it wanted and that assumes that they would make such a, a deal, and it's not clear that they would at this point. It may already be too late, but if we don't even try, we're condemning many, many more Ukrainian men to pointless deaths. Uh, now I want to tell you something. That, now, this is actually breaking just today. Uh, there's, a, there's a headline out that uh, Putin warns the U.S. of a Cold War-style missile crisis. Now, if that sounds familiar to you, it should, because on July 17th, we had on this show... Uh, MIT professor Ted Postel that was warning about the dangers of our decision to say we're going to deploy 
uh, intermediate range uh, missiles that have the capacity for nuclear weapons in Germany. And he explained, he came on our show very alarmed. He actually asked to come on our show for this one. And he explained why this was a problem. Because he said, based on what the missiles we've done here, here's what I expect to happen. Watch this. The deputy foreign minister uh, actually addressed the Russian response. Watch this. This is aimed at us, of course. We must be aware of this. But there is no reason for nervousness or any alarm because we began to prepare for such a development a long time ago. The aggressive course of the United States and the North Atlantic Alliance, led by Washington, is not changing. But we cannot be intimidated. We will find a response. And so you're concerned that when he says we will find a response, that it's going to be in the form of additional short-range nuclear missiles. Right. I think uh, that's a possibility. I hope it's not going to happen, but I think that's the uh, simplest possibility. If the Russians have something uh, up their sleeve that uh, will create a problem for the West, but not this kind of problem escalating the chances of an accident, uh, so be it. That would be good. But I think the very likely response would be the deployment of uh, INF non-compliant weapon systems. Okay, so that's what he told you on the 17th of July, why he was worried and why we like to have him on our show. That has now been manifest uh, today by Vladimir Putin. So I'm going to show you uh, that uh, that same screen that we showed you a second ago uh, about what he said. I'm going to roll down here. So he warns of, of a new missile crisis straight out of Professor Postal's mouth. Uh, and when you look down to what he actually said, was he said, in the flight time targets on our territory of such missiles, uh, which in the future may be equipped with nuclear warheads, will be about 10 minutes. We will take, we will mirror measures to deploy, taking into account the actions of the United States, uh, its satellites in Europe and other nations around the world. So you see there, he's saying the same thing that Postal warned about. He's now saying we're going to do, we're just going to mirror what you guys are going to do uh, and we're our own. And, and when he says the flight time of 10 minutes, the, the reason why Postal was nervous uh, was because he said uh, the re as response time for Russia could be as little as two and a half minutes because he, he's and you can go back and look through our inventory there where he in great detail explains how their early warning system works and how intermediate uh, nuclear capped missiles coming from the European nation or area would uh, go undetected until maybe two and a half minutes before it impacted. And so there's virtually no chance to respond, which is why Russia is saying we're going to do the same thing in return. So now then you have our decision to put missiles in Germany and now Russia's mirroring image, which they did during the Cold War. This is nothing new. This is it's as predictable as the sun coming up in the morning. Now then <clears throat> the, 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 the risk has gone higher. So now then the possibility of nuclear escalation has gone even higher for a war that should never have been fought, that should have been over in its second month, that should be negotiated in and in now. And we're instead saying we're still going to put NATO in, in Ukraine. We're still going to bridge to the future and the inevitability and all this kind of stuff. Everything that Russia needs to have to continue fearing that you're going to do something that's counter to their uh, national security. And now then you see they are taking uh, proactive measures to defend what they view as their national security. And it's as predictable as it can be, and it's unnecessary. So now then you have the nuclear tensions gone up another notch, and it's going to, until it gets resolved, it's going to stay up there, and it can only go higher in the current environment. That's how serious things are right now, folks. This is not a minor issue. It is just another step up the nuclear escalatory threat and risk. And we need to get this down right now. We do not need to keep going with this fiction and this nonsense that this war can be won. So we're going to keep giving them stuff, not paying any attention to the to the bigger issues here. So if you don't care about the Ukrainian people, that alone should drive you to say, let's support this. But if you only care about yourself and your future and your nation and your, your own city, then this is what we need to do. It's time to de-escalate this, get this war off the table and cool the jets of even the possibility of nuclear conflict between the West and Russia. Well, listen, uh, <clears throat> we have uh, some great shows coming up for you this coming week. We have Matthew Ho, uh, Larry Johnson's going to be back, Doug McGregor, as I said, Alex from History Legends, 
uh, Colonel Jacques Beau. I mean, all your favorites, all these great people coming in and may even slide in a surprise guest here and there. You never know what's going to happen here because we keep you informed of the things that you need to know the most. And we are unintimidated and uncompromised. We will tell you what's really going on in the truth, whether anybody likes it or not. You can count on that from us. Be sure and like and subscribe. And we will look forward to seeing you this coming week on Daniel Davis Deep Dive.